Hi, I'm Michael Green, an associate professor of history at UNLV, and I write and talk about Nevada politics and history. And one name that, of course, stands out in that history is Steve Wynn. Steve Wynn would have been remembered in Nevada history, obviously, as a major entrepreneur, a major innovator in the hotel, casino, tourism, and entertainment industry. Now he's also going to be remembered as part of the Me Too movement, amid the accusations of sexual harassment and worse. Well, he also has been important in Nevada's history in another way, as a powerful influence on our politics. And he's not the first, and he won't be the last, important, financial, rich, wealthy, powerful person to influence our lives in Nevada. Nevada is known as the Silver State, and once upon a time, the mining industry dominated Nevada. When Nevada became a state, mining companies controlled the state's politics. On the Comstock Road, William Sharon and John Mackey controlled a lot of the mines. Mackey with his partners, James Fair, James Flood, and William O'Brien, who were known as the Bonanza Kings for discovering a huge vein that ran under Virginia City. So these guys managed to own the water company, lumber companies, railroads, banks, you name it. They didn't much like each other, but it turned out that when Sharon bought the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise, the main newspaper, John Mackey owned 20% of it with him. So it turned out birds of a feather flocked together. When we look at the powers who shape Nevada, they might be competing for dollars, but they also could work together to pursue their interests. In 1862, Congress approved and Abraham Lincoln signed the bill to create the Pacific Railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad, and the Central Pacific was built through Nevada. The guys who owned it were Collis Huntington, Charles Crocker, Leland Stanford, and Mark Hopkins. Leland Stanford is in the university, Mark Hopkins is in San Francisco, Huntington is in the beach and the library. These were wealthy men, they wanted to keep their money, they wanted to maintain their power. So they had no problem with lobbying or even bribing legislators, and they were major employers, they were major advertisers. So the people of Nevada and the newspapers that covered them weren't necessarily going to take them on. When we think of the power wielded by, say, the gaming industry today, it's worthwhile to remember that there were previous companies, previous industries, that did a lot to shape our lives. Gaming and tourism have dominated Nevada's economy since, well, the end of World War II, along with some other things like federal projects and mining. But gaming and tourism certainly have been crucial to our politics. If you think of Steve Wynn and his role at the legislature over the years, Sheldon Adelson, but you can go back further to when Mo Daylitz owned the Desert Inn and other hotels and gave substantial money to Paul Laxalt when he ran for governor. Later, Laxalt was criticized for taking money from Dalitz, who was supposedly part of the Cleveland mob, and he said, well, it would be like a politician from Michigan turning down money from General Motors. Gaming was dominant in Nevada, and it was going to make sure that it had support from politicians who were going to protect its interests. That really hasn't changed. It's the tradition in the Senate and the House that the people you elect to represent your state represent your state's interests. You wouldn't expect Nevada's congressional delegation to try to hurt the gaming industry any more than you'd expect California's to hurt oranges or movies. So it's always worth remembering that the goose that lays the golden egg sometimes is worth protecting, but sometimes that goose is protecting itself.